before we get to our movie, I saw a movie recently called Blinded by the Light. It's about a young Pakistani teenager who finds a connection with the music and working class roots of Bruce Springsteen. Yes. It's a great story. Unfortunately, not a good movie. So I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Instead, I want to talk about one of my favorite Bruce Springsteen songs, Dancing in the Dark. Really? That was the first song where I finally recognized him as a thing. Yes. I mean, I'm sure I had heard Hungry Heart three years before. Yeah. But this was like, this is the guy. It's introspective. It's about a man stuck in life and trying to change his life. But then you get three quarters through the song, you find out this guy's writing a book. <laughs> now that's a deep character. Yeah. In a pop song. There is a video of Bruce Springsteen singing Rosalita, which is probably my favorite Bruce Springsteen song. Women are just jumping on stage, running at him, being grabbed by bouncers, being taken off stage, just one after another, and he looks like he's in heaven. He's so good at his job, he's literally not missing a beat. Yeah. He knows when to take the hug and when to let the bouncer take the take the girl away. Sure. Rosalina, jump a little higher. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Thank you for joining me once again here in the basement, and I hope you're ready to give it all tonight because we are going to try to beat the devil. Oh! <laughs> Oh, I believe this was sent to us by a fan. Yes, and it's been sitting on my coffee table for months. I've been wanting to watch it, and I figure, why don't I just watch it on the show? I've seen this. It made no sense to me the first time, so hopefully it'll make more sense this go-around. Released in 1953, BTD stars Jennifer Jones, Gina Lolo Brigida, Robert Morley, Peter Lorre, and Basement alum Humphrey Bogart. It was directed by John Huston and written by Huston and Truman Capote who, according to Capote, intended it to be a spoof of the Maltese Falcon. Which, of course, was directed and written by John Huston and starring Humphrey Bogart. During the filming of Beat the Devil, Humphrey Bogart lost several of his teeth in a real-life car accident. A young, unknown British actor with a talent for imitating voices was hired to dub some of Bogart's lines while Bogart was unable to speak clearly. His name was Peter Sellers. Okay, now this next story... I don't know if it's true, I don't know if it's a legend, but it's too good not to tell. Humphrey Bogart challenged Truman Capote to an arm wrestling match, and he lost. <laughs> when Bogart challenged him a second time, Capote insisted they wager $50. Bogart lost again. The evening degenerated into full body wrestling, and Capote again reportedly was triumphant. John Houston later said, He put bogey on his ass. He was a little bull. I can believe anything when it has to do with John Houston, Truman Capote, and Humphrey Bogart. Any story could arise from these three people. <laughs> when you find yourself in a situation where you have to beat the devil, usually it's a fiddle contest or a game of strategy. Your gift today is two of the latter. Oh, it's pocket, magnetic, chess, and checkers. There we go. Challenge the devil to a checkers match anytime you want. My father was intensely good at checkers. Do you think that someone can only be so good at checkers? Yeah. My dad could just destroy you in checkers. Huh. I, and I don't know what sort of weird magic that he had. Okay, so fiddle contests. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, we loved the song The Devil Went Down to Georgia. Because it's awesome, yes. Yes, and I was also, I went to a religious school, so I was very afraid of the devil. Mm -hmm. But whenever it would get to the end of that song, I would think... The devil was better. The devil is better. <laughs> because he has that whole orchestra behind him. Yeah, the band of demons. Come descend with us into the underworld that is the old leather couch as we take on a little film called Beat the Devil. Oh, Carlos! Oye, como what? See, this is an unremastered version of the film. I feel like I'm wearing sunglasses. Okay, let's wade into all of this. Four criminals are being hauled in chains across the plaza of a dusty Mediterranean port town. Why? To find that out, we have to watch this movie. Let's go back to six months earlier. 
Billy Dan Rather and his wife Maria are in Portugal. Really, Billy, you mustn't be so offhand with Mr. Peterson. Oh, Billy. They opened that morning's paper to find out that Van Meer has been murdered. Turn on a lamp. Say something. Why are you so silent, Billy? Oh, Billy. Billy knows that it's Mr. Peterson that did it. That are starting to kill off loose ends, and Billy might be one of those loose ends. What's the difference between that and millions of dollars? Billy. This is our big chance. Billy. Where are you going? Billy? Okay, so this gang of roustabouts has got their eyes on this couple. Gwendolyn and Harry Chelm. Gwendolyn, it's your move. Oh. Check. Lost. He can only win when it's magnetic chess. They own this coffee plantation that supposedly has uranium on it. And uranium is good money. His last name is Dan Rather? Dan, Dan Rather? Good morning, Mr. Dan Rather. Dan Rather. His last name is Dan Rather. Ever been in Fort Nevada before? The committee wants you to toddle around. Okay. Right away. I'll be along. Better toddle. I said I'd be along. I don't like to be kept waiting. I said I'd be along! Good laugh does more for the stomach muscles than five minutes setting up exercises. <laughs> Robert Morley is England. If he was the only Englishman left on Earth, they could take his DNA and recreate the entire people. <laughs> you don't care what I think as long as I don't do anything about it. And I won't, unless you ever decide to sick that knife-happy little junkie on me. Watch yourself, lady. I'm knife ecstatic. Billy and Maria invite Harry and Gwendolyn to have dinner with them. They're driving out to dinner and they're chatting away. And they get to the restaurant and they're talking. The restaurant's closed for the season. Oh, but for you, Mr. Billy. Hey, it's Billy. I opened for you. Then you eat my food. Aren't you dressed yet? Are they still at the restaurant? <laughs> no, I think they're back at the hotel. I wanted to see the meal. Oh, man. And you forgot to pack my hot water bottle. I have a liver chill. You know, when I was a kid, I'd always try to get out of school by saying that I had a chill of the liver, but it never worked. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable, and it's your fault. No, you're the one who is responsible for packing your bottle. I'm going to go out and spend some time with that nice Mr. Dan Rather. You know, just a little bit of sightseeing. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> but then they make love to each other. And they're talking, and they're talking, and these other people are talking too. Billy told me you had a chill. Bit of one on the liver. What the hell is this movie about? <laughs> What's going on? People just keep talking and talking. If you were able to do something for him, help him along. Give him a kick in the chilled liver. The land he's acquiring is extremely rich and certain. Oh no, the camera's been attached to a balloon. O'Hara shows up. Billy, good morning. You hate me, don't you? doesn't feel himself quite as irrevocably committed as, as uh, Peterson or the... The scene just lost interest in itself. Do -do -do -do. Peterson informs Billy that we're going to fly out to Africa tomorrow. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't even notice that. You taste like 4,000 cigarettes. <laughs> My old Spanish nurse told me that half the people in the world would be ruined at once if everyone told what they knew. At least that's what I think she said. She was speaking Spanish. I couldn't understand her. They get into a borrowed car and they hit the road. I wish we had a pocket magnetic chess and checkers set to pass the time. That car starts having some car trouble. They have to push the car for a while. The car gets away from them. Well, the car will make it to the airport on time. It goes over a cliff and into the ocean. We're going to miss our plane. Hey, sorry about your car. Bye! Meanwhile, back in the town, Gwendolyn is doing her full body keggles. They get word that their car went off a cliff. You're saying that Billy is dead. I'm saying Dan rather not. Gwendolyn is devastated. She tells Harry that she's in love with Billy. What did you say? I'd rather that you were Dan rather rather than you. Harry doesn't seem to care. In fact, Harry seems to have something going on with Maria. If only there was... Something I could do. My liver's feeling great today, and I'd love to sex you up. Ravello goes to Harry and says, Hey, we're doing this thing in Africa with uranium. Do you want to get in on it with us? We're short two men. Billy and Peterson surprise everyone by showing up alive. Well, it looks like they're going to take a boat to Africa after all. The captain is sober, and the SS Nyanga will sail at midnight. 
As they're getting on the boat, Gwendolyn pulls Billy aside. She says, let's run away from all this. We can do our own thing. No, that's impossible. Why? My wife is Gina Lola Brigida. Come on. <laughs> Might be a little bit awkward, so we probably shouldn't. I'm something of a witch. My old Spanish nurse said I could have been professional. She is a freak. The committee is doing a constitutional around the upper decks of the boat. Blow, let down, Billy. Blow, let down. Blow. Criminals don't sing enough. It's this and guys and dolls. That's the only place you hear it. At sea, there's a telegram. The Chelms don't have all that much money. That's what Harry's parents do. They run a boarding house for decayed gentlefolk. Some call that a cemetery. Chelm reports the fact that they stole his personal items. Yoink! And the captain is like, uh, no. I've been bribed. Go away. And Harry informs them that he knows all about the uranium because Ravello told him. Time factor has entered the picture again. This time, fortunately, it's working on our side. Is he playing bongos while he's talking? Maria's in love with Harry. Only you could make a woman feel like this. A man with an intemperate liver. The lights go out. The lighting crew is on strike. I'll fix this. I know all about engines from when I was in the army in the war. What have you got to worry about? We're only adrift in an open sea with a drunken captain and engine that's liable to explode at any moment. You know, a John Houston movie. <laughs> uh, Who's taking charge? Harry. And he'll foozle it for sure. Harry does fix the boat. Harry pulled a reverse foozle. We may now proceed without further delay and in absolute safety. <laughs> Harry, you foozled after all, you foozler. I'm experiencing something that is rare and beautiful. The female orgasm. Oh, me. Oh, the music is making me tired. Peterson, tell the mate the saw Bedouin. Tell him saw Bedouin. Up on decks, Jack Ross tries to kill Harry. Oh. oh, that's my favorite head. And Billy saves his life. Hey, everybody, I got a secret to tell you. My husband, Harry, is mentally ill. He's paranoid, and he thinks people are out to get him. Harry is chained up and put in the brig. We just hit an iceberg! Suddenly, the ship is sinking. They go down to the brig to save Harry. They find that he's already escaped, and he wrote a note, and he said, I jumped overboard. Screw you guys. I'm leaving. The captain of the Nyanga is furious. He is just screaming and yelling. He's yelling at everyone. He's so mad. Man the lifeboats. They make it to shore. The coast of Africa. Well, boys, start digging for uranium. There's gunfire. Horses. They're captured by this Arab militaristic group, led by this man, Ahmed. Agents of certain foreign governments sometimes try to enter it by stealth. It is totally bogus. Billy makes a break for it. Suck it! He doesn't make it far. He's captured. Everybody's in jail. But Billy is hanging out with Ahmed. Peterson has money. You put Peterson in front of a firing squad. He'll give you a huge bribe to let us all go, and we'll split the bribe 50-50. What do you say? It's execution day. Will he take a check? Turns out that the Nyanga's fine. And there's the captain up there. He's up on deck, and he's just screaming. He's so mad. Could be drunk. I don't know. Probably. Now that we're out of this ordeal, we're going to get on a plane. We're going to go to Nairobi, where that uranium is. Wait. Jack Clayton has something to say about that. He's from Scotland Yard investigating the Van Meer murder. Gwendolyn says, wait a minute, that guy Jack Ross, he's a murderer. He probably killed Van Meer because he tried to kill my husband. Don't run away, Mr. Peterson. That's always tantamount to a confession of guilt. Tantamount is what I call it. More champagne, Clayton? Having more champagne is tantamount to having a good time. So they're taken off in chains and we're right back to the beginning of the movie. It's a circle of life. Oh, and then they get a telegram. It's from Harry. Oh. Ah. <laughs> he lived, he made it to Nairobi, and he found a bunch of uranium. Come on down and let's get rich. And please bring a hot water bottle. They beat the devil. Beat the devil. Any clearer? Yes, actually, it is. I felt like I made it through the synopsis actually telling the plot of the movie. That's the plot of the movie. The little individual scenes, 
I still had to do a lot of running to keep up with the movie and to figure out what exactly I should be listening to in the dialogue and what just was Capote's flourishes. The biggest problem is you hear something and you don't understand it until 15 minutes later. Yeah. When you hear other things that allow you to piece it together. It's so dense and yet gives so little information. All of the accents don't help. Bogey's mumbling doesn't help. The weird flights of fancy of... Gwendolyn don't help. It takes you a while to figure out that she's just a liar, or or rather, not, maybe not a liar, but a fantasist. Kind of the joke at the end of the movie, that she's the one person who ends up telling the truth once the law shows up. Joke. The joke at the end of the movie. This is a comedy. <laughs> Let's see what is there as the comedy. They have a lot of clever things to say about British people and American people and about traveling in faraway lands. It's hard to hear them because the soundtrack is such a muddle and there's this muddle of accents that you have to work your way through. Well, the transfer of this movie on this particular DVD is quite bad. Mm -hmm. When the lights go out on the ship, we couldn't tell it. We just thought, oh, this is the lighting now. I think that this movie was done on the cheap. One gets the feeling that Houston was between pictures mm -hmm. and he said, oh, I have just enough time to do this quickie. When you hear these people saying things almost poetic bits of dialogue, the movie stylistically has to go there as well. It almost doesn't make sense having these people acting as though they're in an Oscar Wilde play when the movie is just set in a dusty town. You know where the movie really picked up? It was when Robert Morley went to Bogey and said, all right, tomorrow we're flying to Africa. Mm -hmm. so, okay, something's going to happen. Yeah. And then they have that great scene in the car well, you know, where the car goes over the cliff, and, and that's that the movie really picked up there. Mm -hmm. Because before that, it was just talking and talking and talking. Once the word gets back that they're dead, and everyone starts plotting, plotting again, kind of like, again, you can't keep up with how the pieces are being moved around the board. Boy, when I was a kid growing up, you just heard the name Gina Lola Brigida, <laughs> who was this angel on earth, and yes. this sex monster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sex monster, yes. Uh, and I've never seen one of her movies until now. The hot water bottle. There's a joke. If you showed that to a 20-year-old, do you think they'd know what it was and what it was for? I have no idea. I have to admit, I'm a hot bottle water user myself. You have one? Yeah, I oh. have one. I bring it out in the winter. We don't have an electric blanket, but it works just as well. Did you inherit it, or did you buy it? I bought it. You can buy them at a drugstore. <laughs> they never went away, folks. Yeah. I highly recommend them. It's weird because this is a movie that should be studied so that you can figure out the intricacies of the plot. And yet, I can't imagine why anyone would want to. I think it might be Capote's fault. Because no one ever just comes out and says something. These people are rich. They have uranium. We're going to steal it. Every scene is this, this intricate web of these clever phrases. And it's like a spider web. I wish I knew what else Jennifer Jones was in. There's another actress named Jennifer Jones, Jenny Jones. She was around in the 80s. She married Wayne Gretzky. She was in The Flamingo Kid. Also the first Playboy I ever saw she was featured in. Well, we were unbeaten by Beat the Devil, and now it's time to beat a path on over to Seen It. Seen It. Sarah Bearhug. My mom has been wanting me to ask you guys if you've ever seen her favorite movie, Mr. Hobbs Takes a Vacation. She loves that movie and highly recommends it if you haven't seen it. I've not seen it. I watched it on Sarah's mom's recommendation. This is a movie from 1962. It is a vacation comedy. A uh, man takes his family on vacation, and boy, is it crazy. There are movies that take place in the past. There's movies that take place in the present. There's movies that take place in the future. There are also movies that are about the present. Direct commentaries on modern life. Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House. The films of Jacques Tati. And even modern movies like The Big Short. Some of these movies, such as The Great Dictator or Network, they become timeless films. Most of them do not. I'm afraid Mr. Hobbs is in the latter category. They don't become timeless because they're too much of their time. Exactly. But it's fun. Her mom's not wrong. No, not at all. It is fun. Yeah, okay, good. Daniel Kramer writes, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood was garbage. The chintzy opening and central dream sequence. Ugh. Seen it. Seen it. I agree with you on one of those three assertions. I didn't think the film was garbage. Didn't think the opening was chintzy. But that dream sequence is pretty bad. <laughs> he wakes up. He's tiny. He's got the rabbit ears. That's, that's very silly. It's a weird movie. It shares a lot of aspects of the Mr. Rogers show, which I think is a, a strength of it. It takes its time. It's very slow. There are so many scenes where two characters are just looking at each other. Mm -hmm. And and I found that really compelling. Also compelling is just the power of iconography. When 
Rogers pulls out the two puppets. Sure. And it's like, it's them. Some good performances here. Tom Hanks does a great job. He doesn't do an impersonation of Mr. Rogers. He does an evocation of it. Yeah, and he does have that weird, saintly, almost creepiness of Mr. Rogers. And there's darkness underneath mm-hmm. that performance. Like, what did his kids do to him? Yeah. Why, why did they drive him back to his show? <laughs> yeah. I do think the film is bold. I think it goes into weird directions. And sometimes it falls flat on its face, like that central dream sequence. But... You know, when a movie does that, you don't mind when it fails, because you can tell that it's taking chances. Elizabeth Dossel saw Roadhouse for the first time and was not disappointed. Seen it. Seen it. Here in this basement. Before we started doing the show, I saw it here. Aaron Yonda claims this is his favorite movie. I think that's kind of a joke answer, personally, yeah. but I don't know his mind. He could be earnest. <laughs> it's a very unintentionally funny movie. It's got a lot of silly moments because they're trying to be so serious. Yes. And it's got Patrick Swayze ripping the gosh darn throat out of a dude (laughs) with his fist. He's that good. This is the thing. I I don't know that much about hotel restaurant management. I have relatives who are in it, but they don't talk to me about it. Okay, you start up a bar in Missouri, and they say, you know what we need? We need the best bouncer in America. (laughs) Call up Swayze. All right, I'm going to give up my life in New York City and move to Missouri to straighten out this roadhouse. Anything else to say about that? Pain don't hurt. I believe I'll get all the sleep when I'm dead. Spencer Riley asks, I was wondering if either of you have seen Fosse's directorial debut, Sweet Charity. One of the things I like about it is getting to see the wonderful Cheetah Rivera dancing on film. Seen it. Seen it. This movie was a bomb. Yes. It starts out. You're like, why was this movie a bomb? It's so brilliant. The first four dance numbers, one better than the other. Just bam, 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 bam. And then halfway through the movie, it just deflates. America was not ready for Bob Fosse. No. They were ready for him on Broadway. Mm-hmm. But they, they're... Because so little of his choreography involves dancing. It's all wrists and elbows and mm-hmm. stepping and walking. Yeah, posing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, Big Spender... They're not moving for most of it. They're just, they're, you know, it, it's 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 bizarre. We can watch it today and say this is brilliant, mm-hmm. this is visionary. But back then, they just thought it was weird. And Shirley MacLaine is great in this movie. Oh, I yes, I just is. loved her performance. I disagree with you slightly about the second half of the movie. I was with it for about the first two hours, and then it gets to that number in the street with the with the band mm-hmm. where she marches off, yeah. and I was like, what a great ending. And then the movie goes on for 25 more minutes, and it ends terribly. It's like the worst (laughs) ending you could have, even though it features a pre-Herald and Maude Bud Court. It does, yes. Garbage hippie ending. I don't mind the hippies at the end. I mind the hippies in the middle. The Church of Love sequence. Oh, yeah. That is horrible. The movie completely loses me there. If you want to have a devil of a good time, you can go on over to our website, welcometothebasementshow.com. There are all episodes we've ever made there, over 200 of them, and there are PayPal donation buttons you can click on to help support this show. Donors like Joseph, who says, Thanks, guys, for giving me 20 minutes every 14 days to anticipate during the dreariest summer ever. Joseph, we release a show every seven days. (laughs) You can watch (laughs) Unboxing, which is more of us. Check it out. Uh, Give it a shot. When you mentioned Terry Gilliam's 12 Monkeys, I had to urge you to watch the television series based on the film. Ignore that it was made by sci-fi. It is immersive, entertaining, thought-provoking, and built to an amazing climax. Tin Men! Joseph's the guy who likes to shout Tin Men. Oh, okay. It's kind of his Stan Lee Excelsior. (laughs) Yes, Joseph, I actually did start watching that movie on your recommendation. And, um... Still working our way through the first season. Tona likes it. I think what you say about ignore that it was made by sci-fi, that's my main problem with it, is that it's like a network drama. Everything is so utilitarian. They cast the the pretty actors who can say their lines just fine. They give them this dialogue that's just fine. It all serves the purpose, and the camera angles in another direction. And there's no style to it. To find out who the rest of our donors are and to see the exciting contents of our mail crate, you can watch Unboxing. That's right, Joseph. You can watch Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. Thank you for watching Beat. <laughs> Thank you for watching Beat the Devil with us, and now watch this. I feel certain that you must have noticed I had a letter of introduction to the Secretary of the Governor. <laughs> I suspect he'll be much more interested in what I have to say than this gin soaked so called ship's captain. <laughs> you mind your tongue! I do not like gin, it tastes like pine needles! It's execution day. <laughs> <laughs>